so welcome everyone to this edition of Going Deep with me, Richard Mills. And our special guest this edition is Alex Cabrera. He, his, his formal title is Chairman and Senior Partner of PWC Philippines, the Isla La Pena organization. And this is one of the nation's largest and certainly I would say fastest growing um, senior audit companies in the nation. And uh, so really nice to have him because he has a, a good broad range of industries across across the nation and across sectors. So please welcome you, Alex Cabrera. Hi, uh, good morning, Richard. And uh, thank you for uh, having me. I, I'd love to have uh, Mr. Richard Mills uh, going <laughs> deep, you in, the, you in the spotlight, uh, Richard, because uh, <laughs> uh, as you know, even before the, uh, the pandemic, and uh, even before these things uh, caught up with us uh, in importance, uh, you and Becca are already at it and trying to do many stuff that help the country. And I want to thank you for that, Richard. <laughs> You're very kind, uh, Alex. Yeah, just for, well, for background, I, it's very clear. We've worked with your group for some time. We do an, an annual event people will... Um, many people attend, uh, we're so pleased, called Asia CEO Awards. And there's a lot of, a lot of back-end work, very, very important work in the assessment, assessment and all of the data that we receive for these many awards that we give. And so your people, uh, your organization have really worked with us well and, and really made this a, a credible key component of the event. So we appreciate that very much. I must tell you, Alex. Our pleasure, Richard. Okay. Well, Alex, maybe if you could start off and just tell people a bit about your organization. What, what can you, what, what people who maybe are outside the industry and, and don't know, what, how, do you, how do you describe your organization? Well, our organization is um, the uh, oldest uh, accounting and uh, business advisory firm in the Philippines. Uh, we are uh, turning 99 quite soon. And wow. uh, it's, it's uh, a year uh, before our uh, centennial year. Uh, so there's a, a lot of uh, uh, <clears throat> excitement uh, on, on this. Because not, uh, not very many uh, organizations would be able to reach uh, 100 years. And uh, we're very happy that... Uh, on our 99th year going into 100, we're still keeping things uh, fresh and, and new. And uh, in fact, doing uh, a lot of uh, things new. And um, yeah, so I'm, I'm really honored to, uh, to be leading the firm um, at this point. Um, and going into the uh, 100 years will be a very special occasion for the organization. Absolutely. And now, Alex, roughly how many people work for the company and exactly what would you do for organizations? I know there's audit work, there's advisory work. What are all these things? Yeah, so, so the firm uh, right now uh, during the busy season is about 1,500 uh, people, including, it... our, uh, including some flexible uh, workforce uh, in there. Um, so we are known to be an accounting or an audit firm, uh, but we're very strong in tax. We're very strong in uh, corporate uh, financial services and very strong in a number of uh, consulting services and uh, of late also in um, digital uh, services, digital related services uh, like data and analytics and uh, uh, automation uh, services or robotics, uh, if you like. Um, so we are, we are a, a very well-rounded organization, uh, multifaceted. We have accountants, we have lawyers, we have economists, and we even have uh, engineers. And of course, we have people who are um, uh, experts in, uh, in human resources uh, as well. Um, so Richard, uh, probably I may say that uh, if uh, the other consulting firms don't do it, we, we probably uh, do it. Uh, because we want to be able to deliver to our client this uh, multifaceted services that, uh, that can really help them um, in their needs. 
Okay. All right. Very good. And maybe Alex, could you tell us about your career progression in the PwC organization? How did you come to work there? What were you doing before? And what were the, the steps you've taken to become chairman? Oh, uh, thank you for the uh, the question, uh, Richard. I'm I'm going to be factual. I'm going to be factual, and uh, okay. if, I, if I may set modesty uh, aside, um, well, um, I I always wanted to be a lawyer, but I I got advice that um, you know the the to be a lawyer you need a four year course uh, before that, and I was advised that the best course would be accounting. I, I wasn't uh, good in math, uh, and, and uh, I didn't think I was good in math, uh, but I'm very analytical. So I, I thought uh, accounting is just analysis, so I took up accounting, and I, I practiced it uh, for, for about uh, al almost uh, two and a half years. Um, practiced it in, in tax, in audit first before I moved to tax, uh, and I moved to tax uh, because I wanted to take up law. And uh, okay. you know, tax uh, certainly gave me the uh, you know the, the right uh, springboard to take up law, and uh, it it's not as as uh, intensely hectic as work uh, compared to audit, uh, where you where during that time you need, really needed to work overnight during the peak season, and you know I, I just can't afford that because I I took up my law school while uh, while working with a firm. And, um, you know, Ateneo is a, a pretty tough uh, uh, law school to, uh, to be studying in because it was a, offering a Juris Doctor degree, uh, which means uh, in one subject, you could be reading 20 to 30 cases a night. And, uh, and there are three subjects uh, every night that you need to attend to. So after, after working... Uh, 5 p.m. I'd be walking and, and, and rushing to law school. Uh, maybe if there's a bit of time, I'll pass by the chapel of uh, the Ateneo Law School before going to class. And then that would be the, uh, the ordeal. You know, for, for a good uh, five years, uh, Richard, that was, uh, that was my abnormal life. Um, yeah, but, but I got through it. And then... Uh, Shortly after I became a lawyer, that was 1995, um, I became a, a senior manager in the firm. And shortly after that, I, uh, I was admitted to the partnership on January uh, 1998. After uh, sp spending nine years in the firm, uh, start, to, uh, start to admission from, from staff to admission in the partnership. So during that time, Richard, they, they said that that was the... Uh, fastest time that uh, anyone has been admitted to the partnership in the firm, you know, so from start to uh, start to finish, a uh, start to admission. And, um, and I think at my age during that time at uh, 31, uh, that I was also the youngest one to be uh, admitted in the uh, partnership. Um, yeah. So, so that was, that was the story of my uh, admission, uh, Richard. Um, I see. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So, so uh, yeah, you, you ask, uh, how did I get to be the chairman? So before I got to be the chairman, I, um, I, I assumed the role of uh, head of uh, managing partner of tax first. Um, and uh, what happened then was um, my, my boss, uh, Tammy Lipana, needed to assume the uh, chairman uh, role in the firm, you know, because of... Uh, you know, a tragic um, uh, heart attack um, was suffered by our head then, Jerry Isla. Of course, before Jerry Isla, we were headed by uh, Corazon de la Paz, uh, Bernardo for, you know, almost uh, about two decades, you know, before she went on to become uh, SSS chief. So oh, after, after her, that was... Uh, uh, Jerry Isla before Tammy Lipana and when she assumed the, that role uh, as head of the firm I assumed managing uh, partner of tax um, so, so the uh, uh, senior uh, partner role or chairman role is not a promotion uh, Richard, it's an election is it? Okay. So, um, 
so so that time um, eight years ago there was a, an election and uh, uh, the partners uh, elected me into the role uh, and uh, thanks to my partners it was an uncontested uh, election there were no other uh, candidates and uh, so since then Richard I, I performed the role and uh, uh, um, you know just uh, paid back by doing everything I can uh, to be uh, very successful at this role. Good. That's very interesting. And roughly how many partners would, you know, uh, vote on, on this uh, uh, appointment, let's call it? Yeah, yeah well, it's, it's everybody, uh, Richard. Um, so, you know, we're, the, the firm has uh, more or less uh, 30 partners okay. uh, during that time. Uh, and, uh, and today, just, uh, just, over, uh, just over 30. You know the uh, the partnership always wanted uh, uh, quality versus uh, quantity, right. so far as the partnership is concerned. And while while the, it's uh, an uncontested uh, election, uh, Richard, uh, uh, I I remember my, myself uh, presenting to the partners and uh, being asked uh, out of the room, and then uh, being asked back to uh, go undergo further grueling for. I think the process lasted for two and a half hours, uh, but that but that's how the partnership is, uh, Richard. Um, you know the difference between being chairman of an accounting firm, you know, versus being a CEO of a uh, corporation, is that in a partnership you're just uh, first among equals if you're the chairman. So every partner has one vote. Uh, so they don't, uh, they won't follow you unless, unless you make sense, and sure. and and they'll follow you if they're convinced that uh, that you're right. So unlike a CEO that you know can uh, can issue directives and, uh, and and he will be followed, it, it's not that straightforward in a partnership, Richard. In a professional partnership, it's uh, a little bit more difficult because you need to achieve the consensus. And, um, and everybody goes along when there's a consensus. Yeah, it's so interesting. Now, so out of the 30 partners, Alex, I would you know, assume there might be a couple of people who would have wanted that position also. You know, and, and also highly, you know, these are highly qualified, good people of, of those 30 people. I mean, these are top people. Um, but why do you think you, why do you think they chose you as and elected you for this role? What what do you think that you have, you know, not not to brag, but but to help others understand? What what do you think you have that others maybe uh, not as much? <laughs> oh, is that okay to ask? That's Richard, that's uh, I, <laughs> I felt shy with that question. I I, I don't know I if know. I was caught, I was caught off guard, but uh, you know the. Uh, you know, the thing about being elected to the chairman role, um, if you like, the campaign really starts uh, from the beginning of your time in the firm, you know, and, uh, and in the firm, I've uh, always uh, spoken my, my mind out. Um, I was uh, fearless about my views. Um, I, I, I was sensible. I wasn't one track minded. Um, I would weigh all, all angles. Uh, before I open my mouth, um, and I, I guess uh, Richard, d- despite my, uh, my my strong biases, whenever I'm giving an opinion, the partners uh, saw in me that I, I could be fair, that I could be uh, objective. I think, uh, but but first and foremost, Richard, I think they were convinced that I was there not for myself. I was there for the yeah. firm. And uh, that I could be there for my partners, that uh, could be there for the people of the firm. And uh, they would be right, Richard, if they were thinking that way, because that, that has always been me. You know, even though, even though I, was a, I was a staff then and I wasn't earning that much, uh, uh, the, the role or, or the job was so romanticized for me that I said, uh, you know, that if the firm couldn't give me that salary before, that I'm going to give the income to the firm before I take something back. You know, and uh, I, 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 always, I always worry about the value that I can bring 
uh, to the equation versus the, the benefits that I could derive from it. I have always been like that, Richard, because uh, if I think any other way, I, I, I would really be ashamed of myself, Richard. And um, I guess the, the partners also saw that, you know, despite, you know, some, some strong views and, and some strong, strong positions that I take, I, I think that they, they sense that I, I only wanted really the best for everyone. And, um, and, and, and they weren't, they weren't uh, unclear about that. They wanted me to lead, and I, I, I thank them for giving me that opportunity, Richard. Yeah, very good. Okay, that's a good story, Alex. And now, Alex, you're a rare person who's both a, a lawyer and a CPA, a, a um, chartered a professional accountant. Um, that's a lot of, that, that's a big commitment of academics. Can you tell us, just for others, what was involved in doing both of those? Yeah, the yeah, amount of time so and work, first, and, yeah. and also whether it was worth it. Do, do you need? Oh. Would you recommend to others to do that? Because that's a lot. That's a big commitment. Yeah. So, so firstly, Richard, I need to set the the record straight. Being a CPA lawyer, especially in the firm, um, it's not that unique. Maybe we oh, have. Really? Uh, okay. Yeah, we 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 have. Um, at one point, we have a dozen CPA lawyers in the firm. And we still have uh, plenty of CPA lawyers in the firm. Um, in the partnership alone, uh, we have four CPA lawyers, including myself. Okay. Uh, if I may mention them, Malu Lim, uh, uh, Carlos Carado, Lawrence uh, Biscocho, we're CPA lawyers. And we have a new, we have two new ones who are also both CPA uh, lawyers. Uh, Brando Cabalsi was recently admitted. And then we're having a, a new admission that's also a CPA lawyer. So you see, it's 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 a thing okay. with us. It's, All right. it's a thing with PwC. Um, and um, although I, I I would say, uh, Richard, really the advantage of, of being both a CPA and a lawyer is that a CPA would be, well, a lawyer would be mostly, I wouldn't say only, all right? Mostly concerned about the whys about the rationale of the law, about the whys. I, I'm not saying that they're not concerned about the how. That would be unfair because there is, of course, always a concern about the how. You know, but the CPA is uh, really concerned not only of the on the whys, but on the hows and on the devilish details of that house. Um, so we, we can go top level and we can go really granular on, on issues. Is my connection good, uh, Richard? It is. Stopped. Yeah. No. Yeah. Top level to granular on, on, on this uh, on these issues. And um, we wouldn't be advising anything that we will not be able to implement. So um, and, um, you, you know, in, in, in fairness, Richard, there will be advisors who would be advising this and advising that. Uh, but they don't really worry about the implementation. Um, the, the viability of that advice and, and whether that can hold up administratively or when it goes to, when it goes to court. Uh, we are so preoccupied with that, Richard, that uh, whenever we advise the client, whether it's corporate finance or, or uh, some uh, assurance uh, advisory or especially in tax, uh, our, our style always, Richard, is if everything is on the table, and the government can see what we have done. Can we defend it? Are we not afraid to advise yeah. it? Can we still defend it? So we don't advise anything along the lines of Let, let's do this because anyway, you know, the bear will not catch it. Or, or let's do this because anyway, this government agency don't go to that extent um, trying to uh, dig deep. You know, we were, <laughs> we're like you, Richard. We go deep. Yes. We go deep. <laughs> And then we tell ourselves, if they go this deep, can we still defend it? Okay. And, and that is what, what we are about, Richard. And I would say that that is also the secret to our longevity and, and durability and credibility as a firm. Okay. Okay, good. And now personally, um, Alex, you, you have uh, you've had overseas educational experience. Can you tell us about that? Um, 
I think if I recall, Penn State and, and, and a, a program at Harvard. Can you tell us a little bit about those and whether those were worth it doing? Because those are expensive. They take your time away from home and wh whether it helped your career. Yeah, well, yeah, first, Richard, uh, in, in, uh, in your earlier question about whether it's worth uh, yes. all that education as a, uh, in accounting, that uh, four years, then uh, reviewing for the board and taking the board and then spending another five years and then reviewing for the bar and taking the bar is uh, in total about 10 years. Um, it is definitely worth it, uh, Richard, because um, if you have this, uh, um, all this education, then you will have more weapons under your arsenal and all your weapons under your arsenal uh, sharpen your talents and sharpen your ability as a professional. But uh, I would be the first to say, Richard, that uh, it's not about the weapons that you have, it's how well you use uh, what you have. And yes. there are many things which are not taught in school. Um, and we, we learn um, most of these things uh, on the go. Uh, there's just not enough um, education available to understand the things that we're doing in the, in the office. Uh, but, but in so far as this uh, supplemental education, uh, Richard is concerned, of course, I, I, I did a supplemental in, uh, in Harvard, in um, um, also, um, uh, where did I take this? Uh, Georgetown and uh, uh, ISA um, and um, uh, C CIBS. Uh, so there, there are supplemental uh, courses that I, I took up. Uh, Wharton, uh, oh, yes. this yeah. Wharton uh, leadership course as well. Um, you know, they're, they're good, Richard. They, uh, I would say that they're very helpful, especially when you are um, trying to assume a role as a leader uh, because they also uh, feed your mind on what's, uh, you know, what's going on in the uh, global arena. Uh, but I would uh, tell you, Richard, there's no education like the education that PwC brings. I, right. I, I, I wouldn't trade for a moment this uh, internal courses uh, that uh, PwC um, has, um, this exchange that you have with these uh, global leaders, uh, this exchange that you, you have with the uh, PwC technical experts and professionals. These are, this is education on a daily basis. And, uh, and if I may, uh, Richard, the uh, education, the supplemental education that you have with this uh, Ivy League schools, uh, yeah, they help, you know, but uh, if I can be candid, they're also incentive, you know, it's like, it's like you're allowed to take this up for a job well done. You know? Yes, <laughs> you know, correct. So they, uh, they give you this, uh, but also the, uh, the firm gives you this because they know it will not go to waste. You know, yes. that it can be translated into something good. Uh, there'll be a multiplier effect uh, out of that uh, fresh learning. Correct. Okay. And just remind me again, you, you started with PwC in, um, what was the, the year? How long have you been with the firm? Yeah, so it's in 1988. 88? Richard, so it's July 1988. So you're, oh, wow. so you're looking at almost 33 years now. Oh, wow. Okay, so stability uh, so, then. Uh, yeah, Richard, when I joined the firm, I was a little boy. You were. And you were. I'm uh, yeah, very proud that I'm now a little man. So. Yes. <laughs> well, and so that's, that's good advice there, because I know a lot of young people sometimes, or, you know, maybe too many are encouraged to job hop, but we see... a in the majority of cases, people who do reach senior levels are very stable in their careers. And you are an uh, example yeah. of that. Yeah, there's a, there's a difference. Uh, in, in, there's so much substance in the firm, you know, because of the different industries that you get involved in. Um, and I'm not only talking about uh, the, the manufacturing and the exporting sector. We're talking about oil and gas. We're talking about mining, we're talking about telco, we're talking about banks and financial um, institutions. And then uh, uh, you, you get involved in transactions, in, in deals, you get involved about uh, on restructuring and, and, and tax planning. 
And so when, when people consult you, um, you, you get a sense on whether, in fact, their question is correct. Because they might be asking you about one thing, but, but you know in your mind, you know, that's not your problem. So like Richard Mills, we go deep, we, we probe, you know, we, we, we probe uh, and, and try to get to the business issue uh, behind that inquiry. And then we try to help them, um, not necessarily on, on the first question or what they think they need. We, we also try to uh, help on what we think they need. And uh, most of the time uh, that we would be right about it because of the wealth of experience uh, that we have. Uh, so given all these industries, these sectors and the multifaceted things we do, Richard, uh, you wouldn't really find the need to go out to find more experience because there's so much experience that you can gain inside the firm already. And I think that's uh, what kept us blued, Richard. But uh, if, if, I can, if I can share, Richard, what really personally kept me glued to the firm is the core values of the firm. Um, the, the firm is, uh, was first and foremost about uh, integrity and uh, I really couldn't see myself uh, outside if I was asked by my boss then when I was younger, if I was asked by my boss to, to do something um, you know, against my principles, then, then I wouldn't do a good job. Uh, and I wouldn't uh, be doing that company that employs me um, the right service. You know, but in the firm, I didn't need to sacrifice any of that. And you know, the firm... Uh, if there would be any fault, they want to be <laughs> number one in all aspects. They want to be number one in client service, number one in quality, number one in revenue and profitability. But they wanted to be number one in risk management. They wanted to be number one in independence. They wanted to be number one in, uh, in integrity. So that's kind of uh, the, the, the kind of mixture in, inside the firm. And uh, you, if you're chairman, you need to balance all that. Absolutely. Um, and, but, but that's also the same thing that kept me glued with the firm because in the firm, we can do what we want uh, without sacrificing our values. And because we can only do it one way, we need to, to really maximize our talents. We need to really synergize to find a solution because there are no parallel solutions. There, there are no uh, under-the-table uh, solutions uh, Richard, everything is about board and everything that we do, we can defend. And that's, that's what really kept me glued uh, with the firm, uh, Richard. Okay. Okay, good. And now, Alex, um, you've in your career had many people you've promoted into their positions. You've been part of uh, decisions for who becomes partner. What do you see are some of the key reasons people are promoted in their positions. What advice would you give to other people building their careers? Yeah, so uh, Richard, I think the, uh, the technical skills is going to be a given. Yeah. So in order to get admitted to the partnership or you know, uh, get promoted to the cor in, in, that, in that corporate ladder, um, the technical skills must be a given. It must be quite clean. I mean, uh, second to none, technical skills must be there. Um, you know, but technical skills alone won't get you promoted. And, and I would say that the people skills will come next. Uh, and, and I would say would be just as important as uh, technical skills. Um, and then you, you need to have a bit of selflessness, uh, Richard, to get there. Because uh, in a partnership, it, it's both uh, an, uh, getting admitted to that uh, elite group, but also surrendering your, your professional um, self into that group. And you need to understand that everything you do is going to bind the partnership. So every good thing you do will redound to the partnership and every bad thing that you do will also damage the partnership. And it, it's that kind of uh, uh, mentality that I think uh, everyone must be mindful of. So I think, yes, Richard, that, 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 that selflessness is also important despite that, uh, uh, or in addition to that high level of uh, 
technical expertise and 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 people uh, expertise okay um now alex we've both seen many people in their careers who are people who are talented people they have good education technical skills as you mentioned um people who have not done well though in their careers well and it's heartbreaking you see people from good families and 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 they just don't do well what do you think are some of the key reasons what have you seen some of the key reasons how people uh, jeopardize their career or, or hold themselves back tough question you know, Richard, I, I yeah i i can i can put a finger on it okay i think i think it's the heart there's there's something that uh, that cannot be taught in school and that is uh, what i call drive you cannot teach a person drive okay. um, you know it it comes from within and but, but if you like we can also call it you know it's an uncertain heart you know because you can i i told you in the beginning richard that my mentality is that doesn't matter uh, what you have it's how well you use what you have you know because it's the heart that that intangible thing that's going to produce a multiplier effect on, on all your talents and and all the things that you set yourself out to do without dedication without commitment without determination you know that that person would not succeed as much as he can you know if if that person has a, a one track mind about being really determined to do something and and um, and really focused on, on doing that he will not let up and um, every uh, failure that comes uh, along the way you know will just be part of the journey you know but if that person is not really wholehearted about what he's doing uh, then i don't i don't think uh, that he will get to the end of the journey because that journey can can really be uh, can really be tough uh, richard um, I, I've seen I've seen a, a number of uh, cases where, even in law school, you know, some of my classmates uh, would tell me, you know, I'm trying it out. I'm, I'm trying it out, you know, because you know, <laughs> maybe they're bored with their life. You know, you know, some some people or most people who try it out, you know, won't really finish law school because it's hard. It's hard. So if well, you're it trying it out, sure. Yeah. It, if, if you're trying it out, don't try it. Don't, don't do it. You know, do something uh, that, that you can be really focused on and you can give, you know, at least 99% of your heart in it because you, you cannot miss the intangible aspect of it. You know, the emotion behind what you're doing. If you cannot put emotion behind what you're doing, you know, better not do it, you know, because uh, you're, you're going to be second rate at, at doing it. Uh, so, so that's it, Richard. To me, that's the differentiation. The heart behind what you're trying to do, you know, will we, we'll set the difference between winning or losing. All right. Okay. Well, Alex, how would you describe yourself then? I mean, are you an extroverted person or do you think of yourself as an introvert? Uh, I assume you were good at school, but let me know were you average or were you really good or just above average? And were you a rule follower, you know, when you were younger growing up or were you rebellious? What, what would you say to those things? <laughs> well, what a question, huh, Richard. <clears throat> it is. <laughs> um, well, first in, in school, um, okay. yeah, I'm, I'm above average, uh, Richard. My, my heart is not into being this, uh, graduating with the uh, cum laude uh, Although I, re I, I realized how useful they would have been if I, if I graduated with, the, with those consistent honors. Once in a while, I'll, 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 I'll be in the dean's list, but uh, you know, I wouldn't really study for, uh, uh, to uh, be recognized academically. Uh, be because I always uh, believe, Richard, that uh, the, the most important medals in school is what you learn. And you learn things in class and you learn things outside of class. And, and in a way, uh, you, you, you can also surmise that I'm not very compliant to the letter with the rules. Uh, but whenever I take liberties, it's because I believe that that's the right thing to do. Um, and I wouldn't be really uh, going with what everybody 
else is doing, uh, whatever is popular. I remember myself, uh, there was one time, Richard, that uh, in that quadrangle, uh, there was this guy with the with the megaphone and said, down with the Marcos uh, regime, let's let's all get out of our classes, let's step out of our classes, let's let's make this a day of protest, um, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And and I was and I was there. And uh, I don't know for for some reason I was <laughs> I was given an opportunity to uh, to to make a comment, and and mind you, Richard, I am not I am not uh, pro dictator. I was I was against it, but I was I was also for respecting you know students' rights, um, yes. attend classes. I was also for respecting you know uh, the professors. So that they can uh, go on with their classes, I, I know they're trying to earn a, a living, and uh, there are important things to be learned uh, during that day. You know, versus only wandering around the quadrangle, feigning protest while really not producing any results. So I I, I articulated <laughs> I articulated that, and I I thought that that wasn't uh, too popular, uh, but I, I I got positive reviews when I articulated that, and no one would. You know, because you know the militant students were so uh, powerful, and uh, they they would uh, they would actually be really one track minded about it. But uh, hey, you know, guys. <laughs> so I, I I said my piece. Just an example, uh, Richard. That I don't always go with the flow. Okay. Uh, when I was a student. All right. But being extroverted or introverted, uh, Richard, I I wouldn't say that I am one way all the time. Because uh, I, I would I would be extroverted um, sometimes, but I will also be introverted, uh, you know. Sometimes it's it's like you know being out there and uh, uh, having having a drink and fun time with friends. Sometimes I'll I'll trade that and just stay home with 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 a uh, with a glass of scotch and watch uh, CNN and Netflix quiet time. That, that I, I would also be that kind of person, Richard. But I'm definitely mixing it up. I'm not always uh, on the extrovert side. You know, sometimes me time, I, I, I value that, uh, that peace. I, I value not being stressed out about doing anything important. And, and, and resting, is I think, is also important for myself. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I've seen you be both. That, that's a good point, both an introvert and an extrovert. I appreciate sometimes when we've had you speak in the past and, you know, sometimes there are stereotypes about accountants that they're introverted and quiet. And I was pleased to say you could really, you know, give a real motivational speech. And uh, so, yeah, so I was impressed. Um but now, Alex, how did your, how about your parents and your upbringing? How did they raise you? Were you from a big family, a small family? Did you, how, how would you describe your upbringing, Alex? Yes. So, so Richard, there's a, we, we are an average family. Um, and um, I have uh, two brothers. So we are uh, three brothers. And uh, I don't know if, if, if I can uh, share Richard, uh, sure. All our first name starts with A, Alfonso, Amelito, and I'm Alexander. And so okay. my mother is uh, Benito, so that's B, and the Cabrera is C. So, but I use that uh, as easy as A, B, C. Uh, in my column, of course, uh, it's also uh, the way that I communicate, you know, what I thought could be complex issues. If I can communicate it quite clearly, then that would be A, B, C. But but in the family, Richard, we're, we're average. And the personality of my mother is, uh, you know, she's, she's always into this very important, non-pretentious things. We'd be an average family, but we would have so much food, Richard. Uh, so much food. And she would prepare very delicious uh, food. You wouldn't, you wouldn't feel we're average when it comes to food. <laughs> but you will see we're average when it comes to uh, vehicle because okay. uh, my, my dad only drives an, an owner Jeep. Uh, he will be average when you look at our clothes. It's, they're presentable, but they're not, they're not branded. Our house is in Antipolo um, in, a, in, a, in an average uh, 
uh, subdivision. We were the first ones there. So we, we were brought up uh, really average, but uh, but I would always uh, relish remembering my, my father, you know, when uh, he has this, this time with us um, during weekends on, and on Sunday while we're trying to uh, shine our shoes, you know, for for the rest of the week. You know, my, my uh, there was a time um, that we didn't have maids and we need to fend for ourselves. My, my daddy is a very, uh, my, my father was a very good, um, um, he, he presses our pants very well. And, uh, you know, our, our pants would always have this one pleats and, and very neat. So he's, he, he's obsessed about that, but he does the ironing and my mother does the, the cooking. And uh, my, my, my brother, my elder brother would do the manly things. And I would do the <laughs> more effeminate things like uh, helping out in the kitchen and uh, sewing uh, clothes, Richard. Uh, believe it or not, I know how to use those uh, old singer sewing machines. I, I do my own pants. And during that time that, uh, you know, you need, you need to shape your pants, baston style, you know, the very, very uh, uh, slim pants. I, 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 redo, I redid, uh, oh, I, I, um, I remodeled all my all my pants. I retailored all my pants then, and uh, so I'm, I was also very good at uh, sewing, Richard, and very good at cutting hairs. So um, if there's any female <laughs> household chores, I, I'd be doing it, you know. But but I would relish these times uh, when we were cleaning our shoes for the week. There there are two very important uh, lessons that uh, my father kept on uh, uh, repeating to us and one of that uh, I carried up to today both of that I carried up to today but one of that is about work and my father said um, uh, children boys uh, no matter what you do remember this one very important thing do not feed your children uh, with stolen food Okay. Do not steal anything because that means that you will be feeding your children from cash which is stolen. And so it, my father kept on telling us, don't be interested in something which is, you know, not yours. Um, and he will feed this to us into our, into our brains. And, uh, and, I, and I really adopted that, uh, that principle um, of making sure that when you're with a firm and you're working, that you stick to your values, that you don't bribe anyone and that you don't facilitate bribe and you're not also bribed, whether, you know, regardless of whatever uh, you do, Richard, and, and you know, bribery is not only concerning the public sector, there's also commercial bribery going on in the private sector, uh, sure. Richard, like uh, uh, the purchasing, uh, in the purchasing, Function, for instance, when suppliers yep. can drive purchasing managers. So there's uh, a lot of that and uh, a lot of iterations of that, Richard. And, and I always remember whenever, um, I wouldn't say temptation, Richard, because I was never tempted, although the temptations are always coming and people are always trying, but I was never tempted. But I would uh, remember these words that uh, my father told me that I, I shouldn't feed my children with anything that is stolen. And the other thing, uh, Richard, that uh, my, my father uh, uh, told us that I really lived uh, to this day, and I even applied uh, among my friends, and I applied uh, among uh, you know, my acquaintances, but first and foremost with my brothers. My, my father said, before you put anything into your mouth, any food in your mouth, you, know, you, you look at your brothers first. Have they yeah. something to eat? Have they something to eat? And I, I always remember that and uh, saw to it, you know, that if I'm, uh, if I'm having something, if I'm having a, a good life, if, I'm, if I have sufficient food, you know, am I, am I making sure that my brothers are also okay? And it, it's the same way, especially when you're chairman of the firm uh, and you distribute profit share. If you're okay, are your partners okay? And um, I, 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 
I always make it a point that everybody is okay. Uh, Richard, coming off from that learning from my father. Yeah, okay. Two valuable lessons, Richard, and I would share them, and they, they really work. The world needs those two lessons, Richard. Sure, okay. Um, Alex, uh, there's a lot of uh, talk about whether, you know, being a leader or being successful is something, you know, that the nature versus nurture argument, whether it's in the genes or whether it's something that is developed. What do you think? Do you think CEOs are, are made someone that's nurtured or do you think they're born that way and they're going to be CEOs no matter what? What, what do you think? Well, uh, CEOs are not uh, too many, Richard, but I would, I would say, you know, being a leader in general, it would be unfair to say that uh, leaders are born um, and, you know, totally not made. Because I, I, would, I would say that uh, leaders can be made, uh, okay. people can be trained to be leaders, but this much I can say, not uh, every leader would be of the same caliber. And, uh, and I, I would say that you can be a leader of a small organization. You can be a leader in your own right. Uh, so everyone would have leadership skills and, and they would be able to display this uh, in their own way. So even on leadership, Richard, I think people can be trained to be leaders. Uh, but whether you become a CEO or not, or to be the top person in an organization, um, then it will have to be something also that's coming from uh, what you were born with, you know, because uh, if you're born with it, uh, then you become a natural at it and, and you will do a better job than people who are merely trained for it. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's well said. Um, Alex, you work in many different uh, industries and, and backgrounds. You hire a lot of people into your organization. What do you recommend or, you know, for young people, let's go down, you know, help young people here for a minute. What fields of study do you think are most valuable for young people? And which ones do you think are less valuable? Yeah, well, if you're, if you're looking about, uh, talking about the today, uh, Richard, yeah. I, would, I would prefer the young people to, uh, you know, to go to uh, technology, engineering and science. Okay. You know, okay. because uh, that is uh, exactly um, what we need or what our country needs. Um, and, and I think it will also do well for the government uh, to help, you know, provide that opportunity to mold our people uh, to be those kinds of uh, professionals or to be in those kinds of uh, endeavor. Uh, while I love accounting and uh, uh, management, um, there's just... Too many of us in this in this field. Uh, okay. There's too many professionals in this field, and they uh, they they go into this field and 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 they change profession. Uh, they go into this field and then they study something else. In a way, it's good because uh, the accounting background or management background always helps, Richard. You know, but but there's nothing like really training for what our country needs or what the present day. Uh, uh, dynamics in our economy needs. And I was saying earlier that, you know, our, our government should uh, provide the, the, uh, that opportunity, the platform for this to happen. And I'm not saying begin with college or even begin with high school. I'm saying begin with basic education. Um, okay. Because Richard, um, as you know, in, in 2018, the Philippines uh, ranked overall last um, in this uh, uh, PISA exams, uh, this uh, OECD uh, backed up assessment really? of students uh, 15 years old on, on math, on science, and most especially on reading comprehension. Now, oh, why, really? why is that? Why is that, Richard? And if you, if you look at these three subjects, um, reading comprehension or to me, that's comprehension, but that's also about communication, right? And reading comprehension and communication, um, this is quite needed in, in to develop good leaders. Sure. And math, 
quite needed in, in our uh, engineering, in our industries, science, in innovation, and, uh, and uh, medical practice, etc. You know, these, these three things are actually what we <laughs> exactly need yeah. today. We need good leaders. We need uh, stronger industries, stronger manufacturing sector so that we can be a stronger exporter. And we, have, we need innovators, not only in technology, but in, also in uh, uh, scientific endeavors. I mean, uh, the pandemic uh, hopefully will be the last one, but it's not going to be the last one in the medical or medicine will always be a challenge. But what do we have to show in these fields? I mean, you want to develop people in, in these fields, you begin with a basic. And that basic begins in, in, in basic education. These three things on science, math, and reading comprehension. And then you, you try to develop students with, with what you have. The industries should be more involved in developing the, the academe. And uh, I, I can go on and on with this, Richard, but... Yeah. Uh, I think I think that's that's what we really need. Begin with the basic, and the government providing the platform, and the industries doing its fair share um, to help the country develop these resources, and and you know, prepare our the Philippine economy for the next stage. Sure, that's interesting. Okay, so a CPA lawyer saying technology engineering is yeah, and I would agree on that. I think we do need a stronger focus. So that's. That's very good to hear uh, you say that, Alex. Alex, another area that I see some people put down is sales experience. Just being able to work with customers, clients, and being able to promote your services to them. Now, some people that I've spoken to, you know, Jovi Hernandez, you know him over at PLDT and others, who would say, you know, sales was their their thing who really propelled them. Now, I know you're in a bit of a different sector, but certainly you need to be, you know, there, you've got competitors and so forth. You deal with customers. Do you think sales experience is something that's important in your career and, and uh, organization or, or, or what? You know, that's, that's a very uh, interesting uh, question or point, Richard, because, uh, good and, and, and probably, um, I would differ a bit on that. Okay. You know, because, uh, and, and, and maybe, 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 maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, maybe, maybe I'm right. But um, our, our policy or my personal policy is never to sell, never okay. to hard sell. That is, you know, because it, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what you're trying to sell. It, it needs to be the substance of it. You need to be very good at it. You need to understand the client needs, you know, so um, and, and be able to offer to them what can really benefit them and not really what you can sell them. Right. So being in this profession is not only about being a salesman. It's being able to offer the, the quality service and being substantive and understanding a client's business. And when you when you talk about. I'm also not overly obsessed about worrying about competition, but only because I believe that there's so much work around uh, that we really don't need to kill each other, you know, to, to have work. And okay. there's, there's, also, there's also dignity in that uh, approach, uh, Richard. Of course, not every competitor is the same. And, and some competitors would always engage you to, uh, to a race uh, to the bottom. I mean, offer the... Uh, offer the smallest fees, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, but there would, uh, there would be a difference, you know, between, you know, just winning work because you're the, uh, uh, the cheapest in the proposal or winning work because you're the most qualified. And, and, and so Richard, it's, it's actually uh, an interesting uh, point that you raised because if for other industries, sales is their thing, um, I would say that for our industry, service quality would be our thing. And our relevance will begin from that and we'll end with that. And if we don't have that, we are not relevant at all. Yeah. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Um, now, you mentioned a little while ago drive and, um, you know, a person's drive or, or motivation. 
do you think drive is something that can be trained or do you think you're born with it and there's not much you can do to improve? What, what do you think? I think, uh, Richard, on, on this point, I would say that you need to be born with it. Okay. It's possible that a person is not really tapping into his drive or into that thing that really motivates him. Uh, he can be the subject of coaching because you can coach a person in, uh, for that person to be able to tap you know, to his uh, strong side. Um, you know, but you can only coach him so much. Uh, drive would need to be internal. And, 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 and I would say that if this is your issue, then you need to find really something that can motivate you. If money doesn't motivate you, uh, find something like your family or being the best version of yourself. Find something that can motivate you. It doesn't have to be any particular popular thing like, like fame. You know, um, and, and to me, what I always shared with our people is, uh, you know, the best motivation uh, that you can have about drive is to remember that whatever you have, all your talents, they're God-given. And um, if, if you remember this parable of this hidden gold, uh, this buried gold, rather, um, and, and uh, you will remember that, you know, God gave you gold or God gave you talents not to bury them. God gave you talents to use them. And therefore, yeah. if you can't find anything that motivates you, you must at least be motivated by this obligation to return uh, uh, whatever God gave you a hundredfold. That is our obligation, not only to ourselves, to the people that we support or to the people that we are accountable to. Uh, that is our obligation to our creator. Richard. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Very good, Alex. Uh, we're making good progress here. A lot of good, good material. Um, Alex, uh, health and fitness and these kinds of things. I mean, this is something that everyone's talking a lot about these days. And gladly, now most people will say, yeah, it's great we're talking about it, but whether we're doing it is another thing. And it's, and it's very hard when you work at senior levels like yourself to really have the time to exercise, rest, you, you mentioned a little while ago, eat properly and so forth. That's hard to do when you're, you have client meetings, you're traveling and so forth. There might not be good food available for you. But what do you do? I see on your Facebook, I notice you play golf, seem to be pretty active there. Uh, but, but what do you do for, you know, your exercise and health and, and eating? What, do you have any special programs and, and how well do, do you um, do you follow them? Oh, uh, well, well, Richard, uh, first and foremost, in, in terms of um, health, I would yeah. say that the most important part would be mental health. And um, uh, Firmwide, for instance, there's, uh, we've been doing a lot of uh, uh, initiatives on that uh, for our people. Um, there could never be enough, really, uh, yeah. Richard, because uh, the profession is... Uh, it's a stressful one. Our job yes. is a stressful one. Look, we're, we're undergoing a uh, the peak season going into uh, April 15, and it's still the pandemic. And uh, a lot of the things we still need to do virtually. And a lot of the work our people would, will need to still do in their own homes. And I, I wouldn't even dare say in the comfort of their homes because in your, in your own home, there's a lot of distraction. And then you, you're also a distraction to the people around you. And yeah. the air conditioning may not be that good. And the space may not be that good. Um, and, and then there's, there's even this thing about uh, people like parents not understanding uh, what, what, uh, what, what a staff uh, does or what our people um, do. And they would, they would think that our people are overworked. Um, yes. and, and that would that would that comment would fit into the minds of our people and etc. So some of our people would feel that they're uh, um, they're really overworked, you know, because of the comments of the people around them. Um, I mean, working in the office is better, Richard. But uh, going forward, it's going to be 
work from home and work from the office. That's going to be the, the combination. But for myself, Richard, I apply the same thing. I try to make sure that I am mentally uh, healthy. And then, uh, but in so far as food, Richard, I'm, I'm really not, uh, not that good at it. I, I just try to make sure that nothing is in excess. So it's a good balance uh, diet, Richard. Uh, but I would also say that I take a lot of supplements. <clears throat> oh, okay. I, uh, yeah, acai berries, uh, uh, green green teas, uh, zinc, this uh, um, vitamin vitamin C, and uh, and um, um, this uh, virgin coconut oil <laughs> for the pandemic. Uh, okay. This uh, oil. I, I I take all that vitamin E. What, whatever I can. Uh, I'm very industrious of, at putting uh, supplements uh, in my mouth. But I, I, I'll tell you a secret though, Richard. Uh, if, if, I have a, if I have a routine uh, that's probably unique, I'll, I'll tell you that, uh, that routine that I have. I'm very strong on carrot juice. Okay. Ever, ever since in law school, uh, Richard, you know, reading financial statements, read, reading numbers, and reading all of this stuff, working working from uh, from eight eight to five and and, and reading uh, uh, reading and being engaged in this uh, uh, laws and and all these reading materials from from not only from uh, from six to nine even after that just continuously reading and studying that they will really use up your eyes and, uh, and during during that time I will always nibble on carrots you know, before I learned to use juicers, and, and, and I, I tell Richard, a uh, dozen juicers, that's, that's not the number. I have, I have consumed more than a dozen uh, juicers, maybe, maybe two dozen juicers, you know, because carrots are tough, and when you juice them, uh, they yeah. really uh, wear out the juicers. But, but I drink uh, carrots uh, almost regularly until today, and they really help my eyes, um, Richard, and... Um, and I would I would say that I, I need to uh, wear glasses, uh, uh, but but I still don't because I, I I'm not used to it. But I can read newspapers without glasses, and uh, I can read books without glasses, and 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 most of the most of the things I, I read until today I, I read them without glasses. So that that's a bit unusual for lawyers. It is. It uh, is. And the other thing, Richard, that that would be in in my arsenal of routines is. Uh, Ginger tea, okay. Ginger because, tea, uh, because I always have uh, I always have ginger tea. That's that's the freshly boiled one, and I use that as uh, water for my coffee. I so, see. Okay. So my, my coffee will have kick, right? It will have kick, uh, and uh, when when you drink your coffee and there's ginger tea, there's a there's a good sensation in your throat. There's there's a good kick to it. I also uh, realize it's very good for uh, for your health uh, to uh, ward off uh, colds and, and and cough and uh, you know uh, even good for your stomach. So th those are the only two things that, in so far as exercise is concerned, uh, Richard, just taking advantage of walking in the in the golf course and uh, yes. a lot of stretching exercises because I need to be nimble in order in order to. Uh, to play well and, okay. and so uh, most of the things i do for my exercise i do to protect my golf i see uh, okay. and, and and that that has been my motivation to exercise because otherwise richard uh, there's not much there because when i played golf i, I gave up everything else uh golf is a mental exercise it's an exercise in in dexterity um and it's a real sport you know i <laughs> Some of my friends uh, ask me, what, what's your sport? I say, go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but what's your real sport? <laughs> <laughs> they, think, they think golf is not a sport. They, they try it. Uh, I'm sure they'll do very poorly in it. Um, <laughs> that's, that's all, Richard. Not, not really, nothing really special. But first and foremost, you know, protect the mental health, Richard. Well, your eyes. Yeah. That's amazing. Okay. So well done. Um. Alex, another area that seems to be key is your, your home life, your family, and in particular, your, your wife. Now, 
on your Facebook uh, page, you have pictures of you and your wife smiling and hugs and all that. It's pretty nice. Can you tell me a little bit about your relationship with her? How did you meet her? And and uh, what, what can you tell us about your, your wife and your relationship with her? Yeah, my wife is a CPA like me. Is she? I, yeah, I, I met her in the firm. Okay. Uh, yeah, and... Uh, right. She she's uh she's fun to be with because uh you know she she can really joke a lot uh, like me so we we clicked while uh, while we were in the firm um when I when I took up my law school uh, she was no longer in the firm then she was she joined the industry and then I I, I realized that uh, you know I was working eight to five then I would I would study from uh, uh, from six to nine. And then I would go to her. She's also in Makati. I would, I would go to her to spend some time with her, and that's additional units mm. for me. So, so I thought that you know this will this will never work, and I need to I need to stop doing this. So I, I did the next best thing, and I married her. Uh, when I was in 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 uh, in my third year in law school, I married her, and I realized that worked out uh, quite well because at least uh, I get a massage in the evening and. Uh, <laughs> Oh, nice! Uh, someone pre- helps me prepare my uh, my, my stuff, and um, yeah, that that's uh, pretty much uh, pretty much the story of it. And uh, when you, you know, Richard, when 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 I was uh, studying law school with my work, people told me you can't do it in Ateneo, and you 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 can't succeed because because they thought that I'd be working. Uh, uh, with a firm, you know, that has, you know, uh, so much, that requires me so much time in my work. And I'll be studying in a law school that that makes you read, you know, all these cases per subject because it's a doctor of law degree. And so they they said that uh, you won't succeed in it, but that's, that's the kind of motivation that I need, Richard, when they said that uh, I can't do it, that, that that's really the kind of motivation uh, that I need, and so when they said uh, that you can't get married also at the same time because that's a whole new obligation, and mm. then I was motivated also by that that they said that it's wrong to to marry, you know, when you're not yet done with your law school, and especially me, I'm also working, so I married when they said that, that I can't do it, but it worked out quite well, Richard, because uh, it really put my life uh, together, simplified my life. True. Okay, good work. Well done. And another area is uh, uh, children. I don't know, do you have any advice uh, or ideas? I mean, life is different these days from when you and I grew up, social media and all these things. Well, what advice would you give others on on raising children, y- younger people? Yeah, so Richard, I'm, uh, I know I'm, uh, I'm a bit, uh, I would say, similar to many, but I'm not too traditional about this um, because I'd like my children to be uh, their own person. And so wh- whenever, whenever there's, an, uh, there's a, uh, a desire on myself to you know, push my children to achieve more, I don't. I don't do that you know, because I don't want to be putting any pressure on my, on my children and, uh, and and you know what what happened uh, to to some who were who felt there was peer pressure and uh, sadly uh, Richard some of these uh, young uh, people they took their own lives yeah and I know. Uh, there was a time that this was even fashionable uh, so yeah. I'm I'm never that I never I never exerted pressure on my children to uh, perform and I I, I never. Uh, Place my children in, in jail. Like, if, if my child wants to go anywhere, I just need to know where it is. And I'm, I'm not a strict parent, uh, Richard. Okay. Um, because I wanted to protect the learning that my children can have um, when they engage and when they become their own persons. Um, but I'll just pass on the values that my father also uh, taught me. And then I'll, uh, I'll try to... Uh, um, you know, when, when my when my child is in doubt, that that's when I that's when I come in. 
you know and i and i always tell my my uh, two kids you know that they really need to be passionate about what they're doing and and um, whatever they're passionate about that should also help them uh, you know earn money you know but, sure. but even that I, i gave up on uh, in the end, I, yeah, <laughs> yeah it's 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 good and it's relevant because i i told my uh, my younger kid who's also a very talented person and he's so cost oriented I, i told him that uh, you know uh, josh you you cannot give what you do not have so if you want to yes. help people you need to you know you need to acquire knowledge you need to have the right degrees you need to have to put yourself in a position to help you know even even have the right amount of uh, of a uh, personal income to be able to to give and and i think uh, that uh, that helped i think uh, my 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 second one form is uh, decisions he's <laughs> he's forming his decisions on the go because uh, you know all, all this um, all this pandemic this uh, this delay in in this licensure examinations you know they're really giving uh, the, the young Uh, a tough time. These young adults are uh, a tough time because mm. what do you do in the meantime that you can't take up the board exams? Yeah. Uh, should you engage in some other work or occupation? And what if you forget what you learned? And uh, when you take the exam, you're, uh, you already forget what, what you learned and you won't be able to, to pass it. But in the meantime, you will need to work and earn a living or will you take up further studies? I mean, everything is suspended and uh, it's, it's really a tough time to decide. And what what uh, young folks really need uh, to preserve is agility, and they need to be agile. They don't need to be one track minded. Uh, whenever they make a decision, they make sure that whatever they decide they decide upon does not necessarily uh, give up. You know all the other opportunities that they have. So agility is very important nowadays, uh, Richard. Okay. Yeah. Good advice. Good advice. Uh... Yeah, passion is good, but you got to be paid for it. Yeah, that's, that's something I have said to mine as well. Um, well, maybe if we could get to some of your ideas about, you know, the global economy and, and business and so forth. But what would you say are some of the main opportunities, say, for the global economy and Philippines, or I'll say Asia in, in particular, Um, you know, a lot of changes over the past year with the pandemic. Do you think some of these changes will go back to the to the old normal, or are we into a new permanent situation? What are some of your ideas, Alex? I know it's a broad question. Yeah, well, well, certainly, uh, Richard. I don't think uh, there's there's uh, any getting back uh, to how we were, um, and and you see uh, all these uh, mantras about. Reset, reform, reboot. But I think yeah. the most important mantra that that we should have uh, globally and as a nation is reform. So okay. reboot, yes. Reset, yes. Uh, but by all means, reform. Because if we reboot and, uh, and, and reset, then we're just back to where we were uh, before the pandemic. And then we will all continue to have all the problems that we're having and i think that the that the real value of the pandemic is really uh, changing uh, advocacies into real actions and um, you know some some corporations would have advocacy some corporations would have actions uh, to back it up you know but the pandemic i, I think sort of uh, engage many organizations uh, to really to really put some Uh, real initiatives and real actions behind uh, um, their programs in environment, uh, um, social help, and um, and governance. And I, I think these are lessons that we should not veer away from um, because this is actually what's going to help us all become sustainable. Um, you know, Richard, to, to be fair, I think even before the pandemic, even before all this became, uh, you know, really fashionable, um, that, that we were really doing a lot of stuff um, along these lines. You know, when, when, I, when I assumed the, uh, 
senior partner role in the firm, it's not just about the quality of work or the quality of the financial statements. We need to be able to uh, go beyond what we're very good at in the profession and, and, and do some good outside of the firm. That's why we were uh, doing a lot of uh, projects uh, for the youth, uh, for, our, uh, for, for the government, for our tourism, helping these uh, many uh, localities uh, nationwide uh, to develop their own uh, economies there, uh, helping uh, local governments. And uh, now we're quite active in the Integrity Initiative and on uh, disaster uh, resiliency in, in Arise. Those are the two organizations that I'm quite active in. Of course, that is apart from my being active in, in, in tax work and, and tax advocacies, because it, it will always have to be Richard, the combination of what you're good at in your profession and what you can do um, for your environment, for your country, for, for other people, I think you will need to be a part of that in order for all of this to make sense. Because if our life is all about our profession and making money, then that's, I don't think that, um, that that's something that you can really be proud of if you're only about that. And you can only be proud of what you're doing if that also translates into helping others. And I think that we have been as a firm about that, uh, Richard, uh, not only about our profession, we are about uh, building trust in society and helping solve important problems. It's our mission and uh, we certainly uh, back it up with actions uh, to give life to that mission. Yeah, okay. Now you mentioned different um, reforms and that's interesting that you, um, you uh, kind of took to that word. Um, but what are some of the areas I don't know, tax reform? Have you, what, what kind of things would you like to see there or, or other parts of, of the economy? You also mentioned tourism. Uh, what, yeah, what, so, what you, can you tell us a bit more? Yeah, well, firstly, uh, uh, I think, Richard, the, um, the reform I, I already alluded to that's needed in the uh, education. Yes. Um, okay. uh, concentrating on, on that. And, you know, um, yeah, the great law is going to lapse into law quite soon, and there's still a lot of incentives there for exporters, uh, Richard. But uh, in order for the export sector to be strong, the manufacturing sector must be strong. And the, uh, the truth of the matter is, save for a few exceptions, our manufacturing sector is still largely in the uh, uh, assembly um, stage. And we're not yet really there in, uh, in project, uh, product engineering and uh, product design. And um, I think that we really need to graduate into that in order to feed uh, those uh, manufactured products into our export sector. Of course, uh, uh, in, in agriculture, uh, Richard, the, a lot of reform is, is still needed. And uh, a lot of reform, uh, I would say, is already happening there. But in order to be self-sustainable, um, we don't only need to support our traditional farmers. We also need to develop our non-traditional non -traditional farming, which is uh, growing agricultural uh, produce uh, in the cities, um, indoor, yes. indoor farming and having, uh, having um, uh, greenery uh, or vegetation inside non-traditional uh, uh, farming uh, places, those that don't need soil, you know, inside buildings yeah. and uh, inside this makeshift, making this uh, supply nearer to, uh, to the demand. Um, there are many things, including uh, cold chain and uh, cold storage, Richard, that, that really needs to develop a lot more in order to uh, uh, preserve these goods. You know, when we looked at, for instance, Davao, we, we, we thought that uh, the problem of Davao is not really the coming up with more produce uh, because they're really producing uh, agricultural products very well. What they really need is to make sure that this uh, produce is preserved and not damaged during uh, transmission because um, at, one, at one point when we were interviewing uh, uh, players there, we, we figured that you know as much as 40% of the produce is wasted uh, from farm to market. And, and only if that 40% is not, is not wasted and, and um, 
there's technology you know like for instance in in the US you know how they how they uh, harvest their apple and uh, clean them up and clean them up and prepare them to market there's like this uh, um, water transport system where the where the apple is uh, transported in that uh, in that water system so what that does of course is to preserve the apple and make sure that they're in good shape when they're until they are packed and i think we need the uh, similar types of uh, technology and, uh, and and preserve all the agricultural produce until they reach uh, market and have better margins i think the virtual economy is also going to help that um, because there could be yeah. more direct access between the farmers and the uh, farmers and the market sure. you know, but uh, in, in that regard you know the the other help really that the agricultural sector needs richard is education of the farmers yeah. The farmers, they don't want to be entering into these contracts. And even if they try entering into these contracts, they can't really help themselves because they lack that basic education. They're not equipped with it. Therefore, they allow other people to do that for them and that, that doesn't really result or maximize the benefits that they can get. You know, they need to be able to uh, uh, have that ability to communicate enter this contract, they, they shouldn't fear this, uh, this part of the uh, commercial uh, transaction, negotiations and negotiating the best deals for them. You know, that's, that's the other part that I would... But the, on, on, on the uh, technology side, Richard, and on the engineering side, I will still start with education and developing our resources and, um, and making our industry perform a bigger role into that development because if we have more resources in that area, then for sure uh, we will have a better performance in so far as uh, the engineering sector and what our industry needs. Um, so we, we need to fight uh, with what we have, uh, Richard. And uh, I think that uh, there, there are viable ways uh, of doing this. Probably don't have that, that time to, to do that today, Richard, but but we feel that there are viable ways of doing it. Um, even in our uh, infrastructure, uh, both the physical and digital infrastructure, um, th there's still a lot of uh, space that can be done, but there's a lot of developments happening in that space too, Richard. Yes. I, would, I would overlay, Richard, all the things uh, that we need to do, all these things that we're trying to do on inclusion, uh, and, and trying to uh, develop our industries and trying to help uh, different sectors in our nation. I would overlay, Richard, governance, good governance. And uh, if, if I may say it, Richard, and not to get you into trouble, um, integrity, integrity in government, uh, Richard. Okay. Yeah, because uh, okay. you know, that, that, that is just the big elephant uh, that's not being discussed because we can hope for the best, you know, but if, uh, if the people that govern us or if the people dealing uh, with, with government agencies, you know, would not make, put it right, you know, then there will be a lot of leakages instead of these leakages uh, being used to serve uh, the public in general. So that integrity, I will, I will put that as an overlay, Richard, in sure. order for the reboot, the reset, and the reform, most importantly, to happen. <laughs> okay. Well, I, there has been improvements, though, it seems, and I know I'm excited about the work that people like uh, Art Togade in, in transportation and William Dar in agriculture are doing. But yeah, I know there's always room for improvement. Um, one area that I got really excited about is tourism. This has been hit really, really hard over the past year, as we all know. Do you, ha do you have uh, many clients in that area? Well, what have you heard about a bounce back? Is it gonna take years or is it gonna be maybe uh, you know, months by the end of the year that things will start to bounce back? Well, what are you hearing, Alex? Yeah, I, I think, uh, well, th this much I can say, uh, Richard, that uh, those who are in the business of tourism, <clears throat> well, they need to be tireless about coming up with uh, coming up with uh, safe ways in order for tourism to happen. But really, the, the main thing here is the behavior um, of tourists. 
uh, this, uh, um, I, I think, I think mentally people are not prepared to engage in uh, so much uh, tourism. But really, the vaccine is really going to help that, uh, Richard. Um, I think if they package tourism as part of uh, you know curing mental wellness, you know yeah. that that will uh, that will really that will really help. And uh, I'm I'm really sorry about the hotels uh, closing, but uh, I don't know it has really not been maximized private dining. For instance, if you convert these uh, hotel rooms into dining areas for families and Okay. And serve them there, and then uh, you know for the hotels to recover their fixed costs in this way. Uh, I, I'm I'm not really sure about this uh, the viability of of this for for large hotels, uh, but certainly for smaller hotels this can be done. Um, and uh, we we've discussed about you know converting the uh, the kitchen of these uh, hotels in, in into uh, you know this uh, Uber type kitchen. You know the, okay. the shared economy yes. where they can cook, cook and uh, deliver for uh, for other uh, restaurant chains. You know, just just make their assets uh, useful in the meantime. But uh, Richard, it's it's really going to be tough, and it will really require the help of our domestic tourists. Our, sure. The um, domestic tourist, uh, you know, what's making it difficult, or is this also Richard the millennials? Uh, they're not really into it yet. Millennials, yes. I don't know, Richard. Millennials want to stay home. The Generation X, like me, uh, we're uh, we're willing to travel. Um, and uh, while while uh, the pandemic is there and there are risks, we would rather you know manage the risk, protect ourselves, uh, you know, but not give up the things you know that uh, that uh, that we're used to doing. Um, knowing that everything that we do has a multiplier effect. You eat in a restaurant, the restaurant owner has business and people there gets employed. And if they earn something, then their money can then their money yeah. can also buy the food that they need and their family can be fed. There's a lot of multiplier effect uh, that needs to go into the minds of everyone. When you go into domestic tourism, you don't only help your mental wellness, you help all the supply chain and the ecosystem of the tourism industry and all the families of the people working in that industry. That is what you do. So don't be discouraged that the pandemic is not yet over. If there are safe ways to do tourism activities, by all means, engage in it. And that, that will be my position there, uh, Richard. Okay. Um, Alex, you've written about the online gaming industry. I think you and I have talked a little bit about that, but what's your view? I mean, they were getting a lot of attention uh, and then now they've kind of all disappeared, it seems, or, or have they? But maybe, can you talk to us about that? Is this something that's going to come back? And is this something that you would like to see come back? Or is it worth the trouble uh, having them uh, here? What, what what are your thoughts on that that industry? I would like to see them make a full comeback and make a bigger comeback okay richard subject to governance okay subject to <laughs> compliance uh, right. with our rules um and we've conducted the data analytics on this and uh and um the senators uh pick them up legislators pick them up and uh, they, they used uh, the approach that we did on data analytics which is to allocate on a per head basis the revenue that the POGOs are making. You know, but my, my view, Richard, on this is quite simplistic. Yeah, first we need to have them declare, right? Uh, yeah. But I don't want to I don't wanna, uh, put more taxes there that can hurt the industry uh, that will discourage them from doing business here. You know, because it is quite helpful to um, um, our economy as well. Uh, but they need to play within the rules. But this is my personal advocacy, Richard. Tax the winners. We need to tax the winners. But the okay. problem with Pogo is that you don't know who's betting, you don't know who's winning. And you can have this information. I'm sure you can have this information if you require them from this uh, local Pogo or these onshore operations of this Pogo that's doing everything for everyone anyway. And and they would they would know these these bets. Now, if you're the 
because the the thing with with this uh with this bets richard is that okay i'm not a gambling man richard i i don't I gamble. know <laughs> but i'm a researcher i'm a researcher <laughs> so the thing with this uh richard is um <laughs> this this these gamblers these gamblers who gamble for fun you see the casinos earn from them yes but this but these high rollers the casino the casinos lose to them really interesting okay and and, and so the the casinos would would have anywhere between i don't believe it's 10% anywhere between okay 30 to 30 to 20% retention uh or 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 hold ratio if if you like which means uh whatever bet they receive they they pay out some of that because the betters uh win but they're able to retain 30 to 20% of those bets so let's say that that is the the figure i'm not overly concerned about the 30 that they retain or to uh, heavily tax the 30 that they retain i just want to tax the winnings Okay. So if someone there is winning, I want to tax that 20% final withholding tax similar to the taxation on uh, on local winnings. And you and you see Richard if I can if I can uh, bore you with math. Yeah, it's what is bigger Richard? The 5% on the 30, the 5% on the 20 or the 20% on the 70. I see. And now if you're if you're a gambling person, if you're and you want $100 If you only win eighty dollars, Richard, because they withheld twenty uh, dollars as tax, will you stop betting? Because no. you only won eighty instead of twenty, it doesn't make sense, right? Correct. You continue yeah. playing the game, and you wouldn't mind it because you're winning. So why wouldn't we tax that twenty, Richard? Okay. <laughs> okay. Good. Uh, good advice. All right. And now maybe if if we go to your own business I mean there's been a lot of changes in everybody's business during the pandemic but do you, what changes do you do you see for your firm and your employees when things go back to normal I mean are you going to have less uh, uh, office space maybe are, are more people going to work from home or I don't know what 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 changes are are you looking at for for your organization Alex Yeah yeah so Uh, Richard, uh, things will never go back to how they were. Okay. Uh, because 100% of the time we're, we're almost in the office. Yes. And what that taught us is that that's not viable, especially during a pandemic. And it was really good that our uh, firm, we were prepared technologically uh, to do our work. And, uh, and in, even, even our big clients were impressed. Uh, that we can do everything uh, virtually, you know. If, even last year, uh, the first year of the uh, uh, pandemic, um, so that that virtual environment, uh, we I think we were actually prepared to that more than we understood. Okay. So we were ready for that. That's where that's why we were firing on all cylinders uh, when when that happened. When when we were um, in home quarantine. Hmm. Uh, didn't stop us from working. Uh, didn't stop us from servicing our clients. Uh, it put a strain on our people, certainly. You know, but uh, but we were trying to be strong about it. Uh, mentally, we were trying to be strong about it. Uh, psychologically, uh, but but I think that the thing is, even after this uh, pandemic is controlled, things will not go back uh, to the way it was. And I think, nor do we want it to go back to the way it was, because just look at the pollution that we helped Richard yeah. by not traveling all the time. So we would want to retain that kind of uh, those benefits if we can. So I think that for not only for our firm but for many of our industries, the model would be the mixed model of physical and virtual, and and that is why. Uh, You know, when we renew our leases, um, we're actually reducing office space, and uh, we're reducing our office space. Uh, you know, maybe as much as uh, 30 to 40 percent, yeah, um, right. depending on, on the number that we come up with. 
uh, you know, even if we encourage our people to uh, to come in to the office nowadays, you can only see as much as maybe eight to ten percent of our people coming in, maybe as as little as five percent, and and wow. and so uh, if they need to come into the office because this is a better place to work, uh, there's air conditioning and there's more space, then they would be here. But, though, mm. but many of our people, they also prefer to work at home. And there are many of our people are actually frontliners, you know, because uh, this is, this is uh, the sad thing, Richard, because the government is not prepared to go virtual. And we would be compelled to, to go, for instance, to offices of the Bureau of Internal Revenue, offices of the Bureau of Customs, you know, because they can't go virtual. And even if we wanted to protect our people, our people would need to work like they're frontliners. So there, there's a bit of risk that they're really taking. And uh, it, it is really admirable, you know, because our people will not fault us for that. They understand it. They, they know what needs to be done. And they, they do that almost on a volunteer basis. They go to clients' offices when they need to. Our audit people, they, they do that as well. And so uh, our people in, in our profession, they're, they're a bit of uh, frontliners as well. And I, I really uh, salute them for having the courage and having the fortitude and uh, the psychological or mental strength to, to do that. I see. Okay. And now you've, um, your organization, I, I believe you, you have started an offshore uh, service providing part to your organization. Is that something that you see as uh, Filipinos are going to have a, an opportunity for that in, in the future? No, no, uh, well, what we've, what we've done is set up an, uh, <clears throat> an office uh, outside. Um, but we, we've set up an office outside and uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's outside where other PwC offices are not, are not there. I see. Uh, and and we have a, of course a, a BPO locally that uh, that yes. Uh, yes. services or can service uh, PwC affiliates and and even uh, some uh, foreign clients. Um, the Philippines will always be in in that uh, in that sector. I would say not not only our firm but the the country will always be in that sector because, as you know, even when uh, Donald Trump was the president of the United States, okay. and he was talking about all that. I never believed it for a minute. And I, yeah. I kept telling my, my clients, you know, U.S. companies will always do what is sensible, which is find sure. their competitive advantage. And the competitive advantage is being able to do the work uh, for less the cost and even, even increasing the quality uh, of the work yeah. using this business model. And, and the thing is, the Philippines is just a bunch of professionals. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a strong side. It's a weak side. It's a strong side because we have our people manning the BPOs, um, and and if if there's a weak side to that, uh, Richard, it's it's about people leaving their own profession to be um, to be part of the BPO sector uh, instead of being engineers or being nurses or being a oh, being I accountants see. for that matter. You know, but uh, when you pick up one end of the stick, you pick up the other. Richard, and we'll, yeah. we'll get the advantage that we can uh, for the moment. That, 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 that other part about the, the needs of the industries, uh, the other industries, they will need to be addressed. But I wouldn't give up this, the strength that the country needs or, or the country has at the moment. Um, the BPO sector is certainly a very, plays a very big role in our economic uh, ecosystem, nice. uh, the 24-7 and and all the uh, supply chain that goes with that. So it's it's going to be strong. It's going to remain strong, uh, particularly if our BPO sector goes up the value chain um, because the, the mechanical parts, they might be automated. Yeah. Not everything, because there's really no substitute uh, to a uh, human being on the other end. And I was uh, talking to this, uh, talking to this uh, client uh, and and uh, uh, and I was uh, receiving this story, you know how a how a Filipina call center agent handles her job. This this uh, uh, this uh, foreigner is trying to send something 
domestically and he still hasn't reached the destination and he was really very angry old old guy very angry and didn't know what happened to the package and then this filipina call center agent said what are this and then she she realized that the package is about um uh, stuff for a lady and she went is she your girlfriend <laughs> she went like that and then there was a, a healthier conversation after that now, how can you teach a computer to do that yes, how can you sure. auto do that and, uh, i mean it's it's gut feel right how do you manage the anger of the person on the other end yeah. and this is uh, this this is something which are which human beings are only uniquely capable of doing yeah it's so true but yeah okay Yeah, it's a continuing opportunity. So there's lots of opportunities for Philippines. What do you think are some of the threats, say, holding the, or, or not threats, but what do you think are some of the things that that can hold the country back that we need to overcome? What 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 do you see? You mentioned education. Are there others? Yeah, govern governance really. Governance, uh, okay. Governance really is the only one thing that can hold us back. Uh, okay. I think I think in order for this to happen the digital transformation should not only be happening in the private sector digital transformation must happen in the public sector and and I think uh, I think this is really key Richard in so far as I'm concerned if everything is transparent and people can be held accountable then they wouldn't exercise too much liberties um, in in what they're doing Uh, thinking that they would not be held answerable for it, but it's not only about being held answerable for bad things. We, if if there's digital transformation and government agencies are connected to one another, it also improves the, the service to the public uh, in general. Yes. Um, if there's if there's transparency, then you know what's going on. You know where your tax money is is going to, and you build public trust and you build yeah. public support. And then the the public will be more supportive of government. There will be more uh, public and private sector cooperation. There will be more trust, and then the country can go forward together as one. There is nothing that we cannot solve if there's so much trust. Um, and 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 you know that uh, you know uh, you're you're not being uh, uh, just being led by by promises or. Or, or or empty statements or generalizations yes. or reasons that are are not really based on facts everything can be there if there's digital transformation then everything is on record then there's trace transactions can be traced uh, from the source from the origin and you know how much it is and how and, and the bidding process that went on and then how how people are paid There will be trust, and the private sector will be emboldened to enter into these transactions with government, because they know that uh, the bidding process is okay, it is is on the merits. Uh, they know that after that they do their work, that they will be paid. You know that uh, there won't be any uh, senseless uh, issues that will be raised, and, and they'll get paid promptly. You know all this can can happen. You know if there's digital transformation. If there's digital transformation that can lead to transparency, transparency that can lead to accountability, and that accountability will lead to public trust. Very good. Yeah. So there's lots of opportunities. It's exciting times, uh, Alex. Um, now for you. So this was a really good session. I mean, this is very good information, uh, Alex. But for you in your life now, are you going to keep on going with your career with no stop in sight, or you're going to slow down at some point? What's your plans for the future, Alex? When when you said, "Am I am I going to stop at some point?" Um, <laughs> it's it's probably the uh, the the scariest stage uh, that I can uh, think of, uh, Richard. My my only desire is to be in that place where my heart is, and okay. I will really do a disservice not only to the organization that I belong to, but also to myself 
and to my family if I'm doing anything uh, that my heart does not agree with. So that is that is the number one thing, Richard. And uh, I think I, I go back uh, to the advice that I'm giving the young. I'm I'm also delivering the same advice to myself. I will never let what God has given me go to waste. And what God has given me is 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 not only what I was given at birth. There's so much experience that I I, I have. Um, there's so much knowledge uh, that I can use uh, for good. And, and I hope that I continue to use it, that I continue to, uh, um, to bring not only value, but, but really what is needed, not only in the organization, but to all its stakeholders. And it's always going to be, Richard, about stakeholders from here on in. It's not only going to be a single-minded, what can I do for this organization so that I get paid? It's not, it's not going to be about that at all. You know, what do I do so that I improve the lives of all the people that I can impact? And um, what can I do for this organization to make it a relevant organization? Whatever that organization is, Richard, whether it's PwC or some other organization in, in, in the future, I, I, just, I just know that if I'm there, it's because my heart is there. And so long as my heart is there, then I can be happy and I can be assured that I will continue to do good. I'm sure you will. But some of your main advocacies, you mentioned governance, you mentioned, I think, sustainability. What are, what are the areas that, that you really want to focus on and really want to make something, you know, a kind of a legacy with? Yeah, well, if, after this, uh, if I retire from this profession, uh, Richard, I want to be more involved in uh, definitely in education, in the education uh, sector, in, in academe. Okay. Uh, there's so, so much that can be done. And not only being involved in a particular educational institution, but really improving the uh, uh, education um, in the country. Um, I, I, I am in a position where I'm able to, to see what's needed to be done. Um, and we need to really take advantage of this uh, virtual environment in order to get things done um, with more facility. But, uh, th- but there's so much to be done in, in education. And uh, I think if, if, if we get that right education, if we address the needs of industries, and if we create the right industries, in order for that to happen, if we, in order for us to create the right industries, we need to deliver the right education. Um, because you see, Richard, my, my thinking is that it's not about what the industry needs today. It's about what industries do we need tomorrow? And for those industries that we really need tomorrow, you know, to, to really kick the country forward, how do we even supply that with manpower, with yeah. the right manpower, if we're educating our people only to address the needs of the industry today. So that's that's the big part of it, Richard. Education will certainly be part of the advocacies. And, and I hope I never uh, cease in my advocacy in, uh, in the Integrity Initiative, Richard. As, as you know, I'm the chairman of the Integrity Initiative and we're well, doing I, a lot of- I didn't uh, know that. I didn't know that. But for, for people watching, this is a big initiative that has really taken off on its own. And I didn't know, Alex, that you were the chairman of this Integrity Initiative program? Yeah, it's, uh, the Integrity Initiative was, uh, was begun by uh, the Makati uh, uh, Business Club, Business Club. Yeah. Um, and the European Chamber of Commerce. It was previously headed by uh, Ramon De Rosario okay. um, Jr. And um, uh, thereafter, I, I took over from uh, Mr. Uh, Ed Chua. Did if you, you okay. remember this, this Integrity Pledge I... that that yeah. everyone was being asked to sign before. That was the beginning of the uh, that integrity initiative. Um, but they were, uh, well, I, I was asked to be a chairman of the integrity initiative. And then um, before, before I go out there advertising everything that we do, I wanted traction, Richard. So we've been working at it for the past three years, having all these uh, projects for the youth, uh, for the uh, 
uh, for the academe uh, and, and for the private sector. Um, uh, one of the main projects of the Integrity Initiative is to uh, release and educate everybody on these uh, case books, which is actually teaching um, the private sector or, or the academe or even the students, you know, that there is a way to do this um, to overcome business issues, ethical dilemmas without sacrificing integrity. And okay. this, uh, th that's, that's, the, that's probably the, one of the key, as, um, key projects that, uh, that we have. Um, even more mature than uh, uh, versus that project, Richard, is the anti-bribery in the private sector. Okay. Uh, we, draft, we drafted a bill with the help of uh, a private sector representative. It's now uh, going to, uh, to the Senate and the House, hopefully quite soon. Uh, we're done with the bill, actually, we're, uh, and we, we expect that to be sponsored by the, by the right senator and the, and the right uh, House of Representatives. The anti-bribery uh, anti in the private sector um, criminalizes you know, uh, yes. the bribery. Yeah, and, and this, I think this will help protect um, assets of the private sector and uh, place on the merits, you know, the bidding, bidding processes um, and, and, and uh, commercial transactions. And, you know, when, and whenever there's, uh, there's fraud in the private sector or there's um, a, a, a fraudulent transaction or bribery that happens, you know, what, what happens is, you know, the person is let go and the things are swept under the rug. And, and you know, those perpetrators are just emboldened, you know, that they can do this. It's, it's like crime does pay. Uh, you do this and you'll, you'll just be asked to leave. And, um, and, and most of the time you're not even, you know, uh, uh, not, a case is not even filed. But, you know, the, um, this anti-bribery in the private sector will, will hopefully uh, change you know this. Uh, um, you know this. These ethical issues. Yeah, well done. Mm -hmm. well done. Uh, there, there are more projects there, uh, uh, Richard. And the value formation in the youth is uh, is one of them. Um, and we already uh, started teaching this uh, uh, this value formation course by converting these photo stories into into modules. And uh, we we taught these modules to. Uh, Public school teachers uh, already, and they're very uh, they're very supportive of it. Uh, they were they were brought to tears uh, 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 with these pictures. Um, you know, these are these are very ordinary pictures. You know, like like the ones that uh, you probably see behind me. Oh yes, okay. Uh, this this one is about friendship and uh, and and uh, that. That picture is about, um, you know, not not forsaking things which are important in life, you know, like like real friends, uh, sure. and don't forget them because uh, when you grow, you know, they will they will be the only things that matter, you know. In fact, people that that you work with who are not your friends, you know, they they'll forget you, but the real friends during your childhood, you know, they they will still be there, and uh, you know, this picture is about that the simplicity of joy of being in the company of friends. But there are more, uh, more pictures about there's We have about uh, 70 pictures uh, like that. And this is about value formation. It, it's picked up you know, from, uh, it's, it's a different approach, but picked up from what Japan does. And, and oh. Japan, before they even teach uh, the young about the technical skills, they teach them about um, leadership skills, behavior and values. And, we want to be able to do that as well in our country. Hmm. So this is just uh, among the few projects of Oof. the integrity initiative. You're mm -hmm. a busy guy. Well done, Alex. Well, a very good story and uh, a very good career. So thank you very much for being part of this uh, podcast, Going Deep with me, Richard Mills, I'm supposed to say. Um, so really good. So uh, thank you again. Alex, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you in person when we can. And thank you so much, uh, Richard. It's uh, I, I'd uh, I'd say thank you for having me, but uh, really, Richard, it's an honor, it's a and a privilege 
uh, to be with Richard Mills going deep. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much again, Alex. And like I said, keep up the great work you're doing with your, you and your people. They're just a pleasure to work with. And just for people out there, our uh, awards judges, there's some very intense, you know, people demanding senior level people. And Alex's group are able to manage and handle their expectations. And I can tell you, it's not easy because I have difficulty managing expectations of it because, you know, there's a lot at stake for these things. So thank you again, Alex, and keep up the great work you're doing. We look forward to seeing you sooner rather than later. So thanks again.